Great. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks for attending today's webinar, Correcting Plan Errors. My name is Eric Daly. I'm the Managing Principal of the Multnomah Group. Uh, as always, we appreciate uh, you taking the time uh, to further your own knowledge set and, and hope that we can participate in that process. Um, most controversial portion of today's uh, presentation may be a subheading of today's uh, title, Correcting Players, How to Fix the Mistakes Almost Every Plan Makes. Uh, uh, contention in setting up the original presentation that it was uh, every plan makes. Uh, so if your plan has made an operational error in the past, uh, that you are in a uh, very, very good company. Uh, but there is the potential that uh, that at least one of you has not, um, although in uh, my years of consulting, finding a plan hasn't made at least an insignificant operational error over the course of a two or three year period. It's awfully, awfully difficult to find given the uh, variety of moving pieces that we see uh, on the qualified retirement plan legislative landscape. Housekeeping items before I jump into uh, the content of today's presentation. Uh, first and foremost, we're recording today's presentation. We've muted your lines in order to uh, highest quality audio to go along with the presentation and for those of you uh, who may wish to uh, view it later. Um, we will be sending a copy of today's presentation uh, probably in the next day or so uh, to the view on today's webinar so you can have access to the uh, slides that we'll be covering, uh, many of which include references to um, additional data sources on particular compliance correction procedures outlined either by the Internal Revenue Service um, or the Department of Labor. Third, uh, there may be questions that uh, you develop over the course of today's presentation. Uh, there are a couple of mechanisms by which uh, you can get those answered. Uh, with your uh, WebEx toolbar, there should be a question answer dialog box. Uh, you have more than Twitter, so uh, 256 characters uh, to uh, ask questions uh, that you may have over the course of today's presentation. Uh, make some of those throughout the presentation. Uh, others, on the other hand, uh, we may delay until the close of today's presentation. Um, if we're able to get to a question, uh, we'll certainly follow up with a written response um, in the next day or so. So if we run out of time and, and don't get to the specific nuance of your issue, uh, we're more than happy to do so and we'll follow up with you directly. With that, I'll jump into uh, the content of today's presentation, uh, correcting plan errors. The that we're going to go through today really covers the primary uh, correction procedures as outlined by the Inter Revenue Service and Department of Labor. We'll spend a little bit of time uh, table setting with regard to um, which of those two agencies has ownership over what issues. Um, I know we've got uh, some uh, on the call today uh, who are subject to only one half of those regu regulatory sets. So, so if you're a governmental plan, um, or a church plan, for instance, you would be subject to the Internal Revenue Service correction procedures, uh, but may not be subject to the Department of Labor correction procedures. That's uh, even for those that uh, have an ability to or do not have the ability to use the Department of Labor uh, corrective procedures because of your plan status. Um, I think it's been accepted at least at this point that if you have operational procedures that would be subject to Department of Labor oversight in another instance that using the procedures that have been outlined by the Department of Labor uh, may constitute a best practice for your church plan or your governmental plan as the case may be. Let's talk about the documentation uh, of uh, corrections that your plan uh, may take. Uh, some procedures that we'll talk about today are self-correction procedures that do not require uh, filing with any of the regulatory agencies. That, however, does not mean that we shouldn't document those issues. Um, and, uh, for instance, a failure to document those may actually create a significant risk for the plan sponsor prospectively. 
agency oversight, as I mentioned before, the Internal Revenue Service governs all issues related to the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, that's where uh, they uh, spend the majority of uh, exclusive uh, of their regulatory activity. Um, we'll talk a lot about uh, operational issues that would relate Internal Revenue Code and their corrective procedures. The Department of Labor, on the other hand, through the Employee EPSA, the Employee Benefit and Security Agency, uh, governs Employee Retirement Income Security Act, or ERISA. As mentioned before, some of you may not be subject to ERISA as we went through the attendee list. The majority are, but again, for those not subject to ERISA, using their corrective procedures does provide some background to help self-correct uh, operational issues where you as the plan sponsor may owe the participants additional dollars uh, based on an operational failure that you've engaged in. It's important to point out that the Internal Revenue Service and Department of Labor um, have significant authorities in overseeing uh, their areas uh, of regulatory oversight for qualified retirement plans. Um, very common for their agency to perform on-site audits. Certainly, they require submission of any reports, books, and records that you may maintain in your role as a plan sponsor. Uh, they inspect those books and records. Uh, do a significant amount of uh, questioning the individuals with regard to areas that they have an interest in uh, overseeing. Uh, and they have the ability to subpoena records and testimony in connection with any investigation uh, that they be conducting. Importantly, while these two agencies deal with different aspects of qualified plan operation, uh, in 2011, they did execute a memo of understanding that allows them to share information back and forth. Um, so there may be opportunities or issues uh, where you have uh, plan operational failures uh, that cover both failures of the Internal Revenue Code and are therefore governed by the Internal Revenue Service, uh, as well as failures of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act and are governed by the Department of Labor. Understanding that in filing an issue with one agency that may uh, set off bells uh, via the memo of understanding with the other is important and ensure that you collaboratively resolve um, any operational issues that may pop up. Agent oversight. Uh, the Department of Labor and Internal Revenue Service have differing statutes of limitations as it uh, pertains to uh, governing uh, your plan operation. The Department of Labor through ERISA has what is typically a six-year statute of limitation for fiduciary breaches, which is their primary concern. However, when they do operational audits of the plans, they traditionally go back two to three years. Uh, potentially, if they find errors back two to three years, they may extend that an additional two years, at least as their experience. But as far as resolving issues, that two to three year window becomes probably your highest risk of Department of Labor oversight. Um, the three year statute of limitations does pertain to the IRC code. Um, the primary reason that we've seen this proliferation of uh, corrective uh, avenues for plan sponsors is until uh, development of these programs by the Internal Revenue Service. The Internal Revenue Service had very few ways to govern uh, the plan sponsor's inability to operate a plan consistent with the Internal Revenue Code. The primary uh, enforcement hammer was disqualification. And disqualification is a significant hammer. All the tax deductions that have been taken by the sponsor are lost, all the benefits that are vested to participants become immediately taxable. Uh, but it's really a very crude mechanism for governing um, insignificant and arguably even significant plan operational layers. Uh, more damage arguably is done to the plan participants in a disqualification uh, than the plan sponsor who is obviously responsible for the failure. as a mechanism to try and encourage uh, plan sponsors to self-correct uh, issues of noncompliance with the Internal Revenue Code in a uniform and specified way. The Revenue Service came up with the Employee Compliance Resolution System, EPCRS, 
And APCRS is, is largely comprised uh, of three different sub-programs to the IRS uh, self-relution system. Uh, first, the self-correction program. We'll go into significant detail about self-correction, identifying self-correction issues, uh, and how to self-correct. Uh, they also have the voluntary correction program, uh, which tends to address somewhat larger uh, operational breaches and does require filing with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, and if you fail to self-correct or voluntary correct, there's the potential uh, that you could go through an audit closing agreement program. So traditionally, once the Internal Revenue Service comes in, uh, begins an auto, or pardon me, an audit process with the plan sponsor, uh, you, you are covered or would be covered under an audit cap settlement uh, with the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, the IRS has put out what I think is a, a, a pretty good guide for some of the most common operational errors that pop up. They call it the uh, 401k mis guide or the 401k fix it guide. We've, we've included a link to that document. Uh, as we'll talk about, EPCRS covers a wide variety of plans that are uh, more expansive than the traditional corporate 401k plan, uh, but they've uh, maintained that 401k fix it nomenclature, but it will provide um, I think very good opportunities to review accepted resolutions under EC, uh, ECP, uh, EPCRS. EPCRS, however, does not cover all issues they uh, uh, generate uh, breaches of the Internal Revenue Code. Um, so for instance, the diversion or misuse of plan assets, you can't merely correct under EPCRS that is, for understandable reasons, a much more significant issue uh, that self-correction in and of itself is, is not an acceptable resolution. And really, other issues that pop up and result in excise or other taxes, prohibited transactions traditionally not uh, uh, eligible for remedy under EPCRS, funding deficiencies. Obviously, governed outside the bounds of EPCRS, failure to file Form 5500, which we'll cover later as the Department of Labor regulatory issue, and then anything that would derive an additional income tax or employment tax liabilities are not issues that can be resolved uh, under the EPCRS system. For plan sponsors, and really didn't get as much attention in 2012 um, as I might have expected. Uh, Revenue Procedure 2013-12 obviously came out then in December of 2013 and provided a significant upgrade to the EPCRS program. Um, some of the primary enhancements were the improvement of the submission procedures, uh, unvoluntary correction program, or VCP, which we'll talk about, so development of IRS forms 8950 and 8951 uh, to cover those submissions. Um, an important one for plan sponsors to be aware of, especially on, on the corporate side, 401k, profit sharing, money purchase, uh, where you be using either prototype or volume submitter documents. The Internal Revenue Service made it very, very clear uh, that any time you make adjustments to the base language of either a volume submitter plan um, or to a uh, prototype plan, be it standard or non-standardized, uh, the modification to the base language would negate any opinion letter that that particular document may have received. Uh, and it had become pretty common for uh, plan sponsors to modify sections of language and make a determination as to what they deemed uh, material about that modification. Uh, the IRS says, no more. If you want to make a modification, uh, you're going to have to do so under a, a custom document submitting. Uh, importantly for a number of sponsors on today's call um, is the 2013-12 guidance added 403B plans is one of the plans that are governed by EPCRS. Um, so there are some nuances in how 403B plans are addressed, but by and large, the resolutions that were laid out in the 401k Fix-It Guide are immediately and directly applicable to 403b plans as well. 
Uh, they included some resolution for matching contribution failures. Um, so sponsors who failed to make accurate matching contributions or correct matching contributions provided an opportunity to correct those. A uh, number of safe harbor plan failures, including the ability to provide notices to plan participants about their eligibility to participate in a benefit plan. Um, also created some interesting uh, corrective procedures for testing failures under ADP, uh, the average deferral percentage test, and ACP, uh, the average contribution percentage test. Uh, 415 failures, so failures that don't take into account the deferral limit uh, now subject to correction under EPCRS. Um, and there was some clarification about law, locating lost participants. So those of you who are in the, in the business of trying to find participants in your plan who may be subject uh, to uh, either notices or have benefits under the plan, uh, there was a nice policy change essentially that negated their uh, letter forwarding program uh, and uh, highlighted kind of alternative mechanisms by which plan sponsors could uh, try and locate missing participants, certainly using uh, commercial location systems, credit reporting agencies are traditionally very good uh, with, uh, 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 with uh, uh, addresses, uh, certainly using the Internet, <laughs> or the Social Security Administration still has a letter forwarding program. CRS program post-2013-12 now covers the, the vast array of retirement plans that are out there, 401A, including K, 403A, even the small plans, SARS, SARSEPs that have been uh, out of practice for well over a decade, simple IRAs, uh, and 403B plans now all covered under the EPCRS program. We're into the three subheadings uh, related to EPCRS. Uh, first, and, and without question, the most attractive um, of the EPCRS legs is the self-correction program if you're eligible for use. The self-correction program covers insignificant, and, and we certainly emphasize the word insignificant because it is important in determining how to uh, manage your corrective program operational failures. Um, insignificant operational failures can be corrected at any time, so there is no uh, in statute by which that if a uh, operational failure uh, extends over a period longer than a year or two that it can't be corrected under SCP. The difference, of course, is making determinations between insignificant operational failures above and significant operational failures. Uh, significant operational failures can still be corrected under SCP. Uh, but there are limits uh, as to when they can be corrected. So your SCP failures have to be made within two years of the year, the problem year, uh, that the error or the deficiency occurred. Uh, by plan amendment is also covered under SCP. So you have an uh, IRC, a 401A17 error uh, failure, which is the failure to implement the compensation cap of what is 255000 for uh, 2013. Um, hardship distribution failures uh, can be corrected. So if you provided a hardship distribution, your plan didn't provide for it, you can make a corrective plan amendment. Uh, same with loans. If you made a loan uh, where your plan may have not have provided it, uh, you can make a corrective amendment for that. Uh, and the early inclusion of otherwise eligible employees. Uh, so any failures where you brought employees in who should not have participated could also be uh, resolved through plan amendment. The beauty of the SEC program is it requires no application fee and no filing. Um, however, it is restricted to these operational failures and still does provide some documentation that's necessary. Um, we'll talk about some of the documentation at the close of the program, but the critical issue for most plan sponsors really rides with with um, are our errors significant or insignificant, and therefore dictating whether we can go the SCP program or what we'll talk about shortly, the VCP program. So those things related to the Internal Revenue Service, there is no bright line as it relates to significance in the definition of significance. It's a facts and circumstance issue like so many. Uh, they have out some preliminary questions. 
uh, you can take a look at to help decide and certainly help document the decision you made with regard to the significance of the error. The first of which is to determine whether the other failures occurred during the reporting period. Um, looking at materiality becomes a primary issue. So you'll see a number of the tests that the Internal Revenue Service lays out. Talk about the percentage plan assets and contributions involved with the failure, uh, the frequency or the number of years uh, under which a failure may have occurred, the number of participants uh, relative to the whole that may have been impacted by a failure. Uh, and to determine whether the correction was made in a reasonable time after the discovery of the failure. So whether you use three, four, five, how whatever percentage of these tests ultimately you use to determine the significance level of a reporting breach or an operational failure, pardon me, uh, should be documented how you made the determination about the level of significance. Statement is maybe the most important here, which is the spot is eligible for self-correction only the operational failures we're talking about in aggregate are insignificant. So in point, if you have a compensation definition issue within your plan, uh, we're calculating on the incorrect definition of, of compensation. As a result, all of your participants are off by de minimis amount. It would be difficult to argue that in aggregate that you had uh, insignificant operational failures. What you would have is a single large operational failure that impacted nearly all of your employee population. If you had one or two among a population of 200, so on how those were calculated and compensated, that would clearly produce a different result. To the Voluntary Correction Program, VCP. So if you are unable uh, to correct your, uh, your operational failure under uh, SCP, then your next best bet clearly is the VCP program. So VCP used to correct significant operational failures, uh, and many of those failures um, are the same failures that you would correct under SCP. However, the difference becomes that we need to make a filing with the Internal Revenue Service. And the Internal Revenue Service does have an application fee for the correction of VCP errors uh, that are filed by plan sponsors. That fee can be calculated but ranges from a low of $375 typically uh, for small plans, plans with less than 100 participants, and small operational errors to a high of $25,000. Uh, so these voluntary correction programs uh, vary dramatically. So clearly plan sponsors are heavily incented uh, to try and find insignificant operational failures before they become significant operational failures and therefore graduate into the, the VCP program. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind with VCP is that memo of understanding with the Department of Labor that I mentioned before. Operational corrections under the SCP program, the self-correction program, do not require a filing with the Internal Revenue Service. As a result, there's no documentation in that the Internal Revenue Service could potentially pass along uh, to the Department of Labor. Uh, the VC obviously is very, very different than that. The voluntary correction program uh, could uh, result in the Internal Revenue Service notifying the Department of Labor, again, if your plan is subject to governance by the Department of Labor, uh, of an operational failure that they feel may have fiduciary consequences uh, have resulted in ERISA breaches as well. So important to coordinate uh, your uh, self-correction programs. We'll talk about the Department of Labor corrective programs here shortly, but important to coordinate those you find yourself in a position where you fixed one problem and created uh, another problem with one of the other regulating agencies. Before I get into the, uh, the, the audit cap program, which is kind of the last of the legs of EPCRS, um, the of whether your, uh, your correction is a self-correction or voluntary correction and whether it includes application fees and filings or not is an important one. 
uh, because obviously an internal revenue service auditor can come back into the process at a later date and determine that you made an incorrect determination about self-correction. Uh, and fortunately, once an internal revenue service agent is there and on the audit process, you can't uh, rectively change your self-correction process to voluntary correction program. Uh, at that point, the only resolution for you as a plan sponsor is the audit closing agreement program. Um, so once the IRS auditors have arrived at your location and you either have not made your corrective action under SCP or CP, um, the only mechanism by which you can resolve the issues is through a negotiated process with the Internal Revenue Service. And at that point, uh, Internal Revenue Service will ultimately determine uh, what your uh, the fees and fines and excise taxes may be uh, with regard to whatever closing procedure they, they deem necessary to correct operational failures. So this creates a much more staged and reasonable opportunity for plan sponsors. It creates a significant incentive to uh, correct all uh, insignificant operational errors as they occur, no matter how time-consuming it may be. Uh, it certainly creates an incentive to uh, file through the VCP program any significant operational errors, uh, because once an IRS auditor arrives on site, uh, the control is lost by the plan sponsor, and at that point, it's really determination by the Internal Revenue Service about how to resolve. It creates a lot of different layers before the ultimate death penalty of the IRS, which, which is plan disqualification, which happens uh, uh, with an extraordinary lack of frequency uh, because the consequences to participants uh, related to that practice. So we're out of time uh, talking through the Internal Revenue Service, the IRC uh, uh, operational failures that, that plans uh, can and frequently do incur. Um, and with just as much uh, frequency, we see issues related to the Department of Labor side. Uh, let's wander through now really the, the, the two primary Department of Labor corrective procedures. Uh, that used with a high level of frequency uh, among the sponsors who are obviously subject to ERISA governance. Uh, but in addition, the calculators and, and uh, mechanisms that have been laid out by the Department of Labor uh, are frequently used by plan sponsors not subject to ERISA governance so that they can repair uh, their potential fiduciary breaches to participants in the plan. The prime mechanism for repairing issues inside uh, ERISA-governed plans is the Voluntary Fiduciary Correction Program, so VFCP. Uh, VFCP is structured to calculate corrective contributions that need to be made by a plan sponsor. Uh, so they look at the principal account and more frequently than not, uh, an earnings crediting mechanism to help resolve issues where uh, plan sponsors may owe plan participants plans uh, contributions based on operational or fiduciary breaches. Go through the VFCP documentation. They've laid out really six sub-areas um, with very strong specified uh, repair mechanisms under VFCP. Um, without question, the most frequently used of those, the delinquent remittance of participant funds. It has been said uh, about the Internal Revenue Service, uh, their guidance as it relates to uh, when contributions need to be made. So if you're a 401k or a 403b plan, uh, contributions made by participants and how long uh, is an appropriate period of time once those dollars have been deducted from a PEC uh, to contributed to a plan trust and or plan uh, holding account, depending on the type of plan structure you may be subject to. Um, the Internal Revenue Service uh, may requirement that it be uh, 15 business days after the month uh, that it uh, was deducted from an employee's paycheck. Uh, the Department of Labor is much, much more stringent as it relates to timing. Uh, theirs is as soon as administratively feasible. Uh, that, like others, is a facts and circumstances.
circumstances test. Uh, but at this point, independent auditors, as part of their review process, um, are frequently seeing instances, continue to frequently see instances where one payroll for you know whatever reason could be technology, could be people who were sick, uh, failed to meet the established standard by, by the plan sponsor. VFC creates a very simple mechanism by which um, a plan sponsor can uh, calculate the amount of additional earnings, make that contribution, and repair a plan uh, where there may be uh, delinquencies of participant contribution. Loans, certainly another area, um, uh, certainly where we would encourage plan sponsors to uh, tread with great caution. Um, but anytime you have a, a loan between a plan uh, and a party in interest, uh, with either you know fair market interest rates or below market interest rates, um, it is obviously very very uh, when you have a plan interacting with parties in interest in a loan capacity. Um, you only can correct through the VFCP program if that is established quickly. Uh, but an area where I would encourage any plan sponsor that's engaging in loan practices to make sure they've reviewed those loan practices with counsel independently. Um, participant loans. Uh, participant loans are frequently uh, established without the proper amounts, duration, uh, don't uh, meet operational procedures. There are mechanisms by which plan sponsors can calculate and make corrective contributions to address that. Uh, purchase sales and exchanges, very similar to loans above, where you have exchanges of property or assets between uh, a plan interest uh, and the plan itself, another area where we would encourage uh, uh, significant caution. Uh, benefits, pay the benefits without using the proper valuation mechanism, and this could be that uh, uh, it could also include uh, vesting issues. So. Uh, a plan participant uh, either was entitled to additional uh, assets because they were further vested than was accurately reflected or uh, potentially the opposite, uh, where they were paid because of their level of vesting. But there's voluntary correction programs within the VFCP program for that. Uh, and plan expenses. Uh, probably the most common here is duplicative expenses. So you got a an audit bill of $10,000 that you, add, you allocated to the trust and maybe uh, improperly allocated it twice. Uh, as a result, you go back, make the $10,000 whole, make additional learning. The FCP process uh, is one of the better documented processes that I think the Department of Labor has laid out. Uh, voluntary fiduciary correction really goes through each of those transactions that I covered, gives you an example. Uh, tell you what the data points you are, that you need to make uh, the corrective process whole. Uh, the calculator goes through and provides calculations of earnings based on dates. Uh, breaches have been both made and then repaired so that you can calculate um, lost earnings without having to go through and calculate on a specific investment by investment basis. Um, and they also have a voluntary model application form. So when you do filings under VFCP, it does require a filing with the Department of Labor. Uh, they've got a model filing that you can send along to the EBSA uh, when you make corrections under VFCP. Last of the corrective procedures from the Department of Labor, another that is frequently used uh, is the delinquent father voluntary Voluntary Compliance Program, DFVCP. Uh, DFVCP covers plans that have filing requirements under Title I of ERISA uh, and they have uh, failed to make a timely filing, so didn't meet the due date of the 5500 filing uh, that was required for any given year. Um, mechanism procedure for uh, DFVCP is, is relatively simple. So the CFAS2 process that a plan sponsor would go through, had they made their filing on, on time, uh, they would still need to make. The big difference is that on the 5500 part one, they'd check box D, uh, which ultimately would notify the Department of Labor that this was a late filing. Uh, and at the same time, they would go through and calculate uh, the amount 
that is required to be paid for the Department of Labor for the delinquent filing. Uh, delinquent filings uh, are, are common. Uh, many times if there's issues related to audit where you can't meet your due date and it's going to require a day or the signer for any fast submissions unavailable, there's a myriad of reasons that you would see delayed 5,500 filings. The vast, vast majority of them operate under the $10 a day for delinquent filings. So you're dealing with due date. If you're a 1231 plan, it may have been October 15th. Uh, for whatever reason, the appropriate people weren't around to make the filing on October the 15th, and it didn't get made to the 17th. Talking about a $20 fee for uh, submitting your uh, DFVCP filing. There are some uh, additional per filing and per plan caps, uh, because also what can happen in addition to kind of the typical we missed our filing date for whatever reason uh, is that you could had plans that you didn't realize were subject to filing uh, and therefore uh, weren't made uh, in a timely manner. Um, or you may have had a significantly late filing that no one realized had failed to be made. $10 a day you know, over a multi-year period can be awfully expensive. So the Department of Labor has established a, a per filing cap, the maximum penalty for a single annual report. Uh, small plans, so those plans not subject to audit under the 100 participant threshold uh, are capped at $750. Uh, large plans capped at $2,000. Uh, this happened relatively frequently on the 403B side as plan sponsors determined which of their plans or all of their plans may have been subject to the Employee Retirement Income Security Act. You had a per plan cap. So had a plan where the sponsor may not have believed their plan was subject to ERISA, uh, later a determination it was, and had to make multiple years of 5,500 filings. Uh, in that instance, the small plans are capped at a $1,500 penalty, uh, and large plans uh, a $4,000 penalty. Additional point to point out for uh, if we have any uh, small 403B plan sponsors, uh, if you are a 501c3 uh, organization and have a uh, small plan, 403Bs get a nonprofit uh, discount on their penalty structure, a uh, per plan cap of uh, $750 on, on those delinquent uh, uh, voluntary compliance filings. The like work paper documentation, and this is true really of all your corrective process. Uh, at any point in time, uh, whether it's through the EPCRS program or the VCP program, uh, the reason you're making that filing is to uh, reduce or eliminate any liability that the plan and the fiduciaries may have for historical breaches. A uh, cool question if an auditor comes is documenting that you made the correct assessment about the method of resolution and the process of resolution. So whether it's through the EPCRS program uh, and documenting that uh, SCP was the correct uh, mechanism because of the significance of the operational failure uh, or calculating that uh, corrective uh, contributions that were made under VFCP and the Department of Labor program were accurate, it's important that you lay the documentation process. Uh, the Department of Labor will have very little, as will the IRS, uh, very little patience for having to do the work to determine that themselves. Uh, a case needs to be made, essentially, in the event that your plan is audited, uh, that the corrective procedure was the accurate procedure under the correct reparative mechanism. Um, so anytime you have a process, even an SCP, when you don't require an external filing go with it, um, it's important that the plan sponsor document the issues that were raised when they reviewed it, either because it was reviewed by an independent auditor externally as part of their year-end uh, operational audit, or if it was just an audit conducted by the plan sponsor that revealed the operational breach. The staff analysis that were used to determine the extent of the failure the methods that were used to arrive at the correct methodology, and then ultimately the corrective measures taken to ensure the error does not recur. 
when you threw the 401k fix-it guide uh, on the Internal Revenue site, a tremendous amount of time is spent um, not only saying how do we resolve this particular issue that may have uh, developed over the course of a year or two, uh, but at least as much time is paid to how does plan how does the plan sponsor ensure that that same error doesn't recur prospectively. Uh, so when you go through your work paper documentation, I think obviously uh, fixing the error that was made is of uh, utmost importance. Uh, being able to document for an auditor, whether it's an independent auditor from uh, whoever's auditing your plan at your end, or in the event that you get a visit from either the Department of Labor or the Internal Revenue Service, uh, they recognize that these are important issues that need to be resolved, um, I think certainly helps make the case that you're operating the plan uh, in the spirit uh, of the regulations as they exist today. I'm going to uh, jump in and uh, uh, take some questions. Uh, the first question of the plan, we see how many of them are operating with errors that need, need correction. Um, the, 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 it depends in what context we see the plan. Uh, a number of our clients uh, have asked us to conduct operational audits of their plan. Um, it's pretty rare uh, if you do a, a comprehensive operational audit uh, not to find uh, an issue. The materiality of the issue, you know, obviously is another uh, a, another step entirely. Uh, but I think if you even to look at independent audit results, so auditors come in and do their year-end operational audit, almost always uh, seem to be an operational breach, um, a limits failure, a compensation calculation failure. Uh, eligibility to participate failure, um, a fair or a missed date to provide a notice to participants. Um, you know, we've, we've created a regulatory environment uh, which by the fee in some instances is uh, pretty broad uh, and, and it has become increasingly more difficult for plan sponsors to do all of those things perfectly, especially when many of them are outsourced uh, to third-party providers. So, for instance, um, on the operational error side with the Internal Revenue Service, those are heavily, heavily contingent uh, upon the support of what oftentimes is an outsourced uh, payroll provider. Um, and uh, it's very easy to find areas where uh, setup of a payroll file may not have been uh, perfect and therefore compensation wasn't caught dates of hire or rehire weren't caught, dates of eligibility may be inaccurate. Um, so it, it's more common to find operational errors than not. I'll wait to see if we have any additional questions pop up. I reiterate for those who may have come uh, later uh, as, as uh, we give people an opportunity here. Uh, we will send a copy of the printed materials out uh, probably in the next day or so. Uh, and by the end of the week, I would anticipate that a uh, recorded version of today's presentation uh, will be available in case I put you to sleep in the, in the first one. Uh, you can listen to the second half after you... Uh, after you dozed off uh, at, at a time that's more convenient. Great. I want to thank everyone for your attendance and participation today. Uh, there are uh, questions or issues that uh, pop up as you uh, review these materials. We'd be more than happy to provide additional context. Uh, the Multnomah Group does uh, frequently operational audits of, of retirement plans. Uh, and helping uh, plan sponsors make determinations uh, about how to resolve operational issues that they may have uh, come across um, in, uh, in, in operating their own retirement plan. So uh, again, thank you for your time and uh, have a great rest of your day.